Good evening and welcome to the ICS Spring Symposium LUX 2021. I'm Shinja Kim, President and Chair of ICAS. Thank you all for joining us at this special event with Dr. Miles Yu on the topics related to Pax Sinica, Korea Peninsula issues, and the U.S. national security. It's my pleasure to introduce today's special guest speaker, Dr. Miles Yu. Dr. Yu is a newly minted ICS Fellow joining the esteemed cadre of ISIS Fellows. In addition, he is a Senior Fellow at Hudson Institute. Also, he is a Professor at East Asia and Military Naval History at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Miles specializes in Chinese military and strategic culture, U.S. and Chinese military diplomatic history, and U.S. policy toward China. Dr. Yu joined the Trump administration and served as a China policy advisor to the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. In that capacity, Miles advised the Secretary on all China-related issues, helped overall U.S. policy toward China, and participated in key U.S. government interagency deliberations on major policy and government actions with regard to China. And other East Asian countries, including Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. He is also a visiting fellow at the uh, Hoover Institution as a member of the uh, Military History Contemporary Conflict Working Group. From 2011 to 2016, he wrote the weekly column Inside China for the Washington Times. Since 1996, he has been an editorial consultant to Radio Free Asia and a contributor to various media outlets, including Wall Street Journal and PBS NewsHour. Dr. Yu received a doctorate in history from the University of California, Berkeley, and a bachelor's degree from Swarthmore College, Pennsylvania, and a bachelor's degree from Nankai University in Tianjin, China. Professor Yu is the author of many scholarly articles on China, military intelligence history, and newspaper columns about contemporary Chinese political military affairs. And he's a recipient of numerous awards, including the U.S. Naval Academy's Top Researchers Award, U.S. Navy Special Action Award, and U.S. Navy Meritorious Award, Meritorious Service Award. So it is certainly my pleasure to have Dr. Miles here with us uh, today as our special guest speaker and hope you enjoy the program and let's give him a big welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. Thank you, Miles, it's all yours. Okay, great. Doctor, uh, thank you, Dr. Kim and uh, thank you, Sanju. And uh, it is a tremendous honor for me to be able to uh, to speak to your whole group, and uh, not only that, um, I uh, I find myself very fortunate to uh, join many of your illustrious uh, senior fellows in your institute. And uh, I look at the list of the participants today. Um, uh, I'm speaking now with a, a tremendous sense of uh, epistemological humility because there are many uh, authors and uh, non scholars on these topics. So. What I'd like to do today is basically, I'd like to basically make some uh, introductory uh, remarks um, uh, of the assigned topics. Um, and then uh, I hope we'll uh, use a maximum amount of time for some kind of meaningful discussion. And I really truly look forward to it. So the, uh, the topic basically is quite broad. Uh, one is uh, Pax Seneca. Uh, another one is uh, the Korea Peninsula. And the third aspect of this is U.S. national security. So what I'm going to, uh, to do is going to basically roughly just uh, touch on, on, the, on, the, on the major aspect of the three major assignments, and, and then we have to go, go into discussion. First of all, uh, Pax Seneca. I assume it refers to uh, China's ambition to become a global hegemon, if that's the word that uh, we all prefer to use. Uh, uh, as Dr. Kim mentioned, that I just stepped uh, down from uh, serving as a Secretary Pompeo's China Policy Advisor uh, in the State Department. Uh, 
if you uh, look back 50 years from now, look at the, uh, the crony achievements of the Trump administration in foreign affairs, I would have to say it's really in the China policy arena. Uh, China policy arena, we, we not just change the policy, we completely revamped the very foundational concepts of some of the policies and it, uh, the defining nature of the US-China relationship. Uh, and I think it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, as many of you probably would agree with me that uh, it's, uh, it's long overdue. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the most important thing is that, you know, uh, Donald Trump along with Secretary Pompeo, I think single-handedly changed the global dialogue on China in a, uh, a little bit over, over uh, four years if you include the, the campaign uh, period. Uh, and now we look at China as not only the existential threat, but also a global threat. Uh, threat. So the Chinese uh, uh, China problem is no longer a regional, it's not even an Indo-Pacific, it's a global threat. When I was at the State Department, you know, I thought I was brought in just as a China expert. So I convened some of the meetings uh, on China and open to, to a lot of people. And turn out the participants normally is four or five times more than what I anticipated because every bureau in the State, State Department has a China issue, uh, not just the Indo Pacific. You can talk about Africa, you can talk about WHA, and you can talk about you know uh, Europe, and and uh, you know in some of the technical aspect of uh, 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 topical bureaus as well. So. This issue is is really is is all encompassed and it involves many aspects of this. You know, the funny thing is, let me just first of all to talk about why China uh, challenge is global and existential. Now, Pax Seneca is no longer an aspirational uh, uh, vision. It could be very true. It could be very very real and very near. You know, uh, the State Department is euphemistically called the uh, foggy bottom. Uh, uh, foggy is not just the, the physical uh, uh, real re revelation. It's actually conceptually, a lot of stuff is very foggy and opaque. One of the most important uh, 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 sort of uh, opaque concept and uh, uh, about uh, US-China relationship is the question is, is China still a communist country or is China a capitalist country? You know, this is a very simple question. You walk on any street in America, people would ask you that. You know, Thomas Freeman of New York Times famously walked into the street of Shanghai. He found a bagel shop and he said, ha ha, this bagel is very good, just as good as New York bagels. And therefore, China and the US and uh, Shanghai and New York probably is operated on the same principle. They're pretty much the same. Therefore, uh, the, the earth is flat. And other people may disagree with Mr. Friedman with his optimism. Um, with his, uh, uh, his uh, very optimistic cosmopolitanism. And they might say, oh, Shanghai bagel is not go as good as New York, New York bagels, and, but we can make China a more responsible bagel makers. And therefore, uh, we still hope that our New York, New York, New York bagels would imp impact China. Hopefully China will learn from us. Uh, that kind of conceptual opacity uh, uh, is something that I think we, we try very hard to deal with, uh, to get, a, get rid of, and I think we succeeded. Uh, the, uh, the, the one of the most important uh, policy orientation we, we did in this regard was, uh, uh, Mr. Pompeo gave a speech uh, to the Hudson Institute in New York in October 2019, in which he made a very strong statement. Uh, the statement was that, the Chinese Communist Party today is not the same as the Chinese people. And uh, as expected, we got the strongest protest and, uh, uh, and uh, counter uh, argument from the Chinese government. I and mean, this really freaked them out because uh, 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 that's the illusion they want us to keep. Uh, so we recognize the Chinese people who are predominantly uh, uh, you know, preponderantly obsessed with uh, daily pursuit of their materialist again and the capitalist the way of doing things. But the Chinese Communist Party, and particularly the inner core, is a diehard Marxist-Leninist. And uh, you don't have to really go far just by listening to uh, Secretary General Xi Jinping 
Um, and um, uh, probably every 10 sentences out of every day, seven of them is about ideology, about the party, about socialism, ultimate triumph. So this is a, 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 a conceptual clarity that we developed. And I think that probably is one of the most important things uh, that we, we, we uh, clarified during the, uh, during the Trump administration, particularly under Secretary Pompeo's uh, uh, leadership. And uh, he made a speech in July 2020 uh, at the Nixon Library in which he uh, systematically revamped, reevaluated uh, the uh, China policy and some of the conceptual frameworks since Richard Nixon and it came to the same conclusion. Uh, so that is very important. Now we say the Chinese Communist Party, its inner core really is a Marxist-Leninist aiming at creating an international order with, with a different model of governance under the Communist Party's, Chinese Communist Party's leadership. So this is, is since China's economic outreach is global and is every aspect of the global trade system it has Chinese fingerprints in there. So we have to really figure out to what extent China can export its global practice, its internal uh, domestic practice of its, its party control to the bro uh, to, 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 to the international arena and practice such as uh, uh, information control, such as how uh, the party control, the political, economic, even social aspect of a daily life uh, of, of the people under its, its, uh, uh, its rule. So those things were very, very important. So we deal with the Chinese Communist Party intent. The intent party will become much clearer to us. Uh, I, we think we believe Chinese Communist Party intent to control the global uh, strategic communication networks, global infrastructure uh, uh, frame, and uh, even uh, global, uh, for example, uh, uh, system of uh, financial settlement, uh, um, issues like that. Um, and uh, they particularly uh, venture deeply into some of the very uh, advanced technologies that has global implications, particularly in cyberspace, deep sea, and even polar. So those areas that we have to be very, very uh, uh, aware, and we were at, at the time. So. And then the issue probably uh, we have to deal with is what about the Chinese nationalism? So we believe that Chinese nationalism is a means through which to fulfill the Chinese Communist Party's uh, blueprint uh, for global dominance. And in nationalism, you know, uh, 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 there was a famous uh, MIT professor, Lucian Pai, who wrote a very famous essay. The title of the essay uh, he, he, uh, he, he gave was how the Chinese nationalism was shanghai by which he meant that Chinese nationalism, everybody has, every nation has its own expression of its national pride, national uh, pride in its own heritage, in its own legacy. But the Chinese nationalism was Shanghai, according to mm -hmm. Professor Pai, in the sense that the party in charge of China only emphasized on strengthening the state itself, rather than to change the nation it's a, it's, a, it's a political structure, it's a relationship between state and the individuals, like what the Meiji regime attempted to do. So in other words, Marxist Leninist party of China tried to emphasize the absolute necessity to create an all powerful state to carry out what the party basically says, the dictatorship of the proletariat. So that's where Chinese nationalism is right now. So of course, there's always this, this, uh, this uh, uh, deeply rooted Chinese uh, uh, self-centered Sinocentrism. And that obviously is, uh, is easy to, to find out uh, in China as we witnessed uh, uh, on a daily basis, uh, uh, particularly you know, in recent days against uh, uh, some of the Western brands. Um, and of course this week is the fabulous vehicle of uh, uh, Tesla that nobody in America really could afford to have one. So, uh, so that's basically uh, uh, one of the things that we uh, we 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 clarify uh, this, uh, this this uh, this this uh, uh, this this issue, the co this conceptual clarity. Secondly, China is uh, a, a existential and a global threat, also because not only because of its in intent, but also because of its capabilities. In the last 20 years also, particularly in the last 10 years also, Chinese capability have grown tremendously. Uh, 
is incapable of fulfill its uh, uh, stated intent. Uh, that's why uh, many of us became very alert. Um, it's it's a military has become much stronger. Its capability to conduct cyber warfare, its capability to disrupt international financial system, and all these issues, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, and plus some other uh, deep worries that we still have no definite answer uh, 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 to, uh, such as the uh, the the COVID. Uh, so so in other words, China is a country of consequence, and that is really it. Really is existential and particularly uh, worrisome to us all. And another part of is, is China, unlike all other communist countries in 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 uh, 20th century history, 21st century as well. You name it: the Soviet Union, North Korea, um, and even Vietnam and Cuba. Uh, China is the only Marxist-Leninist country that has been afforded the total benefits of a global uh, a trade system of free market nature. So China is uh, fully participating in the uh, global uh, trade system uh, that is based on free market and reaped tremendous benefits. Uh, so that's why we're trying to sort of, you know, to sort this out. How did, the, how did we get the, the, uh, in, into this, uh, uh, this mess? And obviously, there are some past policy uh, mistakes, and uh, and the most importantly, it also uh, has something to do with the conceptual misunderstanding of the nature of the regime. And we hope we Americans believe that uh, we are all created equal, and so by extension, that given the chance, everybody would behave just like the United States. For example, if we bring the Chinese into the WTO, we expect China surely is going to follow the rules, and just like uh, uh, everybody else. Uh, so that is uh, that is basically some of the uh, the, the Pax Seneca uh, uh, analysis that I'd like to offer here. Now, what did we do in the Trump administration? Uh, and I think you know, in specific policies, we set up a few uh, very important uh, new uh, new rules. One of the most important things, obviously, is the principle of reciprocity. Uh, in other words, uh, 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 we basically uh, treat China not as a special case. Uh, China get away with a lot of things because we think China somehow uh, is a different country. It has is the country burdened with the long history and it has <laughs> with incredible demographic challenges. So therefore, we tend to give China a break. Uh, but now, we basically treat China as an equal, equal uh, uh, member of the international community. We, we reciprocate with a lot of things uh, uh, that you probably have seen in the news all the time. But most importantly, I think at the beginning of the Trump administration, uh, uh, it was uh, 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 announced that we will have a new relationship with, with big countries, with, uh, with sovereign threats, such as China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. In China, per se, we have entered the age, uh, we transform from the age of full engagement to a new kind of framework that is uh, strategic competition. Uh, and then the introduction of competition in this relationship is particularly poignant because it basically points out two very fundamental things that were new. Number one, competition means that all sides compete for the first place. Uh, it's not exactly zero sum game, but like all competitions, like Olympic games, like a tennis uh, play, like a uh, like a horse race, you could only have one winner. And this is important to understand because the Chinese Communist government has been saying for decades, and many of American policymakers truly believe it, that the U.S.-China engagement model is a win-win solution. And now we realize that's not win-win. Win-win uh, from Chinese perspective it means Chinese win twice and we lose uh, uh, twice. So uh, that's not going to be good. And competition is also important in this regard. Uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, competition uh, means that all participants in this race, in this competition, must follow the same rules. That's why you see from the Trump administration, in all dealings, we've emphasized on um, setting the rules. Even during this uh, uh, trade talk, the phase one, it's not about how many more tons of uh, soybeans China will buy from uh, Iowa farmers. Rather, it's more about the structural rules-based approach. 
So that's a very important thing that we, we, we deal with. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's new. Uh, and uh, the third aspect of this new policy that, that I, was, I would suggest is that, uh, you know, for many years, we, uh, we followed the Nixon Mao model of uh, 求同存异. This is a Chinese way of saying, you know what, we, think we, we just work on the common ground and we basically ignore all those uh, differences between these two countries. Now, common ground mostly is a geopolitical expediency, like the crisis, uh, you know, uh, in Vietnam, in North Korea, and during the Cold War, obviously, it was the Soviet Union. What are the differences? A difference is basically the political ideological differences, systemic differences, such as human rights, such as intellectual property uh, 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 protection, such as geopolitical uh, uh, hot issues. Uh, so all those issues, that basically characterize the Nixon Mao framework. And it's been going on for like a, more, nearly half, uh, half a century and it works fine. But that's the problem because we looks fine only on the grounds that we, we share, we agree to, but on some of the fundamental issues uh, and it is going to have some kind of a catastrophic uh, encounter. And so Trump administration changed that. We basically forced the Chinese to deal with us on the multifaceted uh, front. In other words, we have to confront China, not only on trade economic uh, uh, front, but also we have to confront on the human rights front. We, we, we told the Chinese that you, didn't, you would not expect us to say nothing when you lock up the 1 million Muslims in the concentration camps in Xinjiang. And you, you should not expect us to say nothing when you bully people in Hong Kong and uh, uh, in Taiwan. So this is a, this is a, 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 a it's not just a word, word deliberate trans, uh, confrontational, is that we try to deal with the US-China relationship with, uh, as it is, not what, not what we wish it to be. In other words, the U.S.-China relationship is is a very multifaceted. It, it's very complicated, and we have to be very candid. We have to be very uh, direct in dealing with that. And I think there is no better person um, I could uh, imagine than Secretary Pompeo because he was very candid, very honest, very straight with the Chinese. Not only on the good side, but also on the uh, on the side that we we disagree we share different uh, we uh, we disagree in terms of value and uh, the principles uh, so uh, so those are those are basically the, the i will say the, you know uh, how we we uh, how my views on the chinese uh, global ambition and uh, uh, they were uh, they were attempted to to dominate uh, uh, global affairs it's korean peninsula uh, now I don't have much to say because uh, we have many experts over there. All I have to say is this. Uh, in Korea Peninsula, we also have uh, a couple of you know, uh, conceptual clarification that I thought was very important. Number one, uh, the issue of a, a multilateral approach uh, versus the unilateral approach. We have been accused of being uh, solving this Korean nuclearization problem unilaterally. Uh, and uh, you know that's true, uh, but also we 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 also uh, uh, adopted the multilateralism uh, as well uh, in a very very substantial way. So it's not really like either or multilateral versus uh, unilateral. We combine them both. It's a very realistic approach. First of all, let's just say multilateralism versus unilateralism. And President Trump realized that the old model of six-party talk solve the problem is useless. Uh, if you read his books, uh, you will know that he deal with the source of the problem. And that is, he really, really didn't like have a, have manipulated the middleman to solve this problem. So that's why he wanted to directly talk to the source of the problem, Kim Jong-un. This is the philosophical foundation for his uh, uh, approach to talk to Kim person to person. Uh, in Singapore and in Hanoi, and turned out to work work fine. Um, and I think we get rid of the China um, as the manipulative middleman, and and so that's a very good thing. And for the first time in many decades, since the beginning of this crisis, uh, China uh, does not play a pivotal role in solving this North Korean problem, even though uh, China does play an interesting way, an interesting role, and a critical role in the implementation 
of the UN resolutions that Trump administration has built a coalition for. Uh, so it is in the implementation of UN sanctions that we we con conducted the multilateralism at its uh, at its best. Uh, so uh, even though it's now uh, getting a uh, little bit loose here, but we have uh, built a, a a quite effective, not hundred percent effective, but quite effective international enforcement uh, regime, forcing China to 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 comply in many aspects. Uh, so. That's the uh, multilateral versus uh, uh, unilateral, is it? Uh, but secondly, obviously, was a it, 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 it's it's working. Um, uh, no matter what the people say, and uh, during the four years of Trump administration, I don't think that you can say uh, Kim Jong Un has escalated his uh, his uh, uh, cantankerousness. Uh, so, and I think you know, all the, all of this, of course, wrapped up to uh, to one thing that is. Uh, 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 Trump's uh, ultimate uh, approach to all these international issues that is America first. America first doesn't necessarily mean that America alone. And, uh, you know, I'm going to conclude my remarks by pointing out one very important uh, uh, realization that I, ha I developed. That is, uh, the Trump administration actually was the administration of, of, uh, of first principles. In other words, they asked the most fundamental principles. Uh, 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 of the problem, uh, you know, all this uh, increase of, uh, of NATO budget uh, uh, for joint defense, that was not the real issue that uh, President Trump uh, had with the European allies. The issue really is what is the purpose of NATO after the Soviet collapse? NATO was created in 1949 to challenge, to face the one singular challenge from the Soviet Union. So NATO had to redefine its, its mission. If, the, if the, the global threat does not come from Russia, Russia is a threat, but was Russian threat existential? Was a Russian threat global? Or is it China that is existential and global? And NATO has to redefine its mission. So that's basically is at, at the root of the problem between uh, uh, between the United States and our European allies uh, in the NATO. So. I would uh, basically say that, uh, uh, and I think more and more, and, and, at the beginning uh, of the administration, we had a, uh, a lot of problems with our allies uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, but gradually, uh, as our European allies uh, dealt more and more with, with the CCP, and I think uh, you know, uh, we have come much closer, much closer. And on key issues, on, uh, for, so for example, 5G, on issues of, uh, of uh, uh, joint defense, and uh, even you know, NATO Secretary Stoltenberg was talking about NATO marching into uh, Indo-Pacific as one of its core missions. I mean, that's pretty astonishing to me. So uh, again, this is uh, uh, is America first, uh, 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 and I, I don't think that's really, really uniquely uh, uh, America. Every country its leader would say their his his or her country is first in uh, developing global strategy and uh, uh, multilateral or bilateral relationships. Uh, so I will, I think I'm going to just uh, end there and I would, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to any of the uh, discussions. Thank you, Miles. Joe Bosco, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Miles. That was quite a, uh, quite an amazing presentation. I really appreciate you sharing your, those thoughts with us. I wanted to shift focus a little bit from the nature, the internal nature of the communist regime in China and look at the geopolitical, geostrategic aspects by asking you, to what extent do you believe uh, Beijing is cooperating, uh, colluding with Russia, Iran and North Korea to kind of encircle the US, divert the US and distract our attention from one crisis to another. And if that is happening, how can we respond to it uh, without being trapped uh, in a being spread all over the globe? Can we respond to China if Russia invades Ukraine, for example, or if Iran does something against uh, Israel or North Korea starts detonating uh, nuclear weapons or missiles? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Joe, thank you for that uh, very uh, uh, excellent question. Uh, 
You know, Russia and China have had a very peculiar relationship of, over the last, uh, what, 70 some years. One very key component of that uh, peculiar relationship is uh, both of them try in an overt or covert way uh, uh, to compete for the position of number two of the world. The United States was number one. Who would be the chief opponent of the, of the United States? You know, you see this uh, from the 1950s. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Mao uh, split with the Soviet Union, because Mao thought the Soviet Union was too soft. They didn't have the guts uh, 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 and they were revisionist. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, Russia right now is still not used to be number three, number four. Uh, Russia still wants to be number two. Uh, Russia, uh, I would say, Putin is uh, is a sentimentalist. Uh, in a similar way, uh, like Winston Churchill after World War II, you know, Winston Churchill was profoundly disturbed by the fact that the Great uh, British Empire declined. So the last India, you know, lost Swiss uh, control over Swiss Canal. So he was not a very happy man in the fifties and sixties. So Russia, the same in a similar way, uh, no, uh, Putin was um, just not. Putin is doing a lot of things to gain global relevance, while China is striving to gain global dominance. And there's a difference between struggling for relevance and struggling for dominance. Uh, so, on the other hand, I personally don't believe China and Russia share fundamental strategic common ground. Russia's approach in global affairs is much more opportunistic than systemic and long-term. Uh, Russia and China look strong right now. They, because of the, they share some common ground on some regional conflict issues, uh, like Syria, for example. Uh, other than that, Russia and China share some very fundamental differences. And Russia is just as leery about rise of China as many of China's uh, uh, other 13 neighbors. Let me explain how and why. You know, China tries to exaggerate the degree to which Russia and China are strategic allies. Now, Putin never feel comfortable to call China a strategic ally. There is no military alliance of any sort. Whenever China buys some very big platform weapon from Moscow, Moscow simultaneously sells the same thing, even at a larger quantity, to many of China's adversaries, like Vietnam and India. So what China is trying to do, what Russia is trying to do is to play power, uh, balance power. Uh, uh, diplomacy. And secondly, uh, I think, you know, uh, Russia is also very leery of its, uh, uh, the vulnerability of the strategic rear, that is uh, uh, Russian Siberia, Far East. Russia wants to make uh, uh, the Far East developed by Chinese money, but also it wants to have Japanese involved as, as well. If you look at the Russia's role in Southeast Asia, the South China Sea. It's very peculiar because Russia, at one point, uh, Putin summoned all the ASEAN country leaders to Sochi and to have some kind of summit during which they talk about the freedom of navigation, the importance of, 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 of a sailing of communication unfettered. Uh, it's almost the same rhetoric that we're talking about. So I think that Russia does not want to alienate China but Russia, I don't think Russia wants to be an ally with China. I highly doubt the possibility that in the case of a hot war, when China ventures with any of its neighbors, Russia would join in uh, 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 the fight. This is very different from the situation of 1914, when you have two giant alliances and any, any little regional conflict would, would, would uh, invoke a uh, global conflagration. Uh, I must also say well, uh, uh, one more thing, and I think that is that is uh, Russia and China uh, are very 
uncomfortable with each other over the issue of Central Asia. Uh, you know, uh, after 9-11, China felt that it's, uh, Central Asia is a very uh, important place uh, to develop, to have control over, because the U.S. is marching into that area in stride. So China started this idea of Shanghai Cooperative Organization, the SCO. Initially, Russia was supposed to play a major role. China is just you know, a, a junior partner. Uh, but now China has completely taken over that, that organization, have a predominant influence in that area. So Moscow, I don't think that Russia is very happy about that. Uh, and if you look at China's inroads into Kazakhstan or the other stands in Central Asia, Russia is very, very leery of that. Uh, many of this, uh, many of its, uh, uh, you know, uh, of this uh, uh, gigantic deals Russia and China have struck looks really good on paper, but in in actuality, last time I checked, they, they were just uh, you know uh, agreement on paper. This four hundred billion dollar gas uh, and deal that went nowhere. Uh, and uh, also, you have uh, uh, some of the uh, 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 very uh, grandiose promises of bilateral trade. And I think you know trade is important, uh, but uh, Russia is also very leery of China's uh, stealing of its uh, military uh, design. And just uh, last week, Russia sent uh, a Russian uh, who is spying for China to 20 years in jail for selling China uh, military secrets. So Russia, I mean, also. Uh, during the COVID, I think Russia expelled, had, I was a tens of thousands of Chinese in the most unceremonious way. And uh, uh, the Chinese government doesn't want to, didn't say a word about that. So I think, you know, there are some issues for Russia and China to act together, but those were the issues of convenience. And I don't believe there is a, a, a imminent uh, worry about a military alliance between Russia and China uh, that's similar to, say, the Triple Entente or Triple uh, Alliance of 1914. Thank you, Miles. Tong Kim? Thank you, uh, and thank you, Dr. Yu, for doing this for us. Uh, my question will have to do with the denuclearization of North Korea. I don't think China's role is critical in the sense that whether Chinese will uh, will or will not carry out or implement the, uh, <coughs> strict the compliance of a UN resolutions or by persuading North Korea as a fraternal socialist partners uh, to uh, give up uh, North Korean nuclear weapons, uh, uh, even if a Chinese would guarantee that uh, it will provide its own version of extended deterrent to North Korea. Uh, China, uh, in my view, the North Koreans simply would not leave its fate of uh, survival in the, at, at the mercy of a Chinese, uh, Chinese whatsoever. Now, here is the question. Uh, having said that, what would you think of the view that the United States fully accommodates North Korea and pitted against China, just like Nixon and uh, uh, Henry Kissinger did uh, earlier when, it, when they opened China to play it against the Soviet, old Soviet empire. Okay, so uh, that's a very complicated question. Uh, let me try to answer in the, um, uh, uh, hopefully it will be uh, meaningful. Uh, the Chinese North Korean relationship, um, uh, uh, on particularly uh, from the perspective of the nuclear weapon, is very similar to the Soviet uh, Chinese relationship of 19, late 1950s and early 1960s. Um, if you recall, uh, uh, the Chinese Soviet split in late 1950s and early 60s uh, um, over many issues. One of them, of course, is the ideological differences on global and international situation. But what a specific issue was really uh, whether uh, China uh, could and should develop its own nuclear weapons. Uh, the Chinese wanted to do that because the Chinese did not believe the Soviet nuclear umbrella promise uh, is a rock solid, number one. Number two, uh, China wants to get out of the control, total control of the Soviet, uh, uh, Khrushchev in particular, who Mao personally disliked. 
So China wants to develop its own nuclear program and, uh, uh, and ask Soviet Union for help. And Khrushchev said, no, we're not going to help you. And we want to have continue this, this uh, big brother versus small brother relationship. And so therefore, no soup for you. And that's one of the reasons why there is this, this, uh, this, uh, this created the impetus for the Chinese to develop his nuclear weapons. Obviously, China detonated uh, his first nuclear device in 1964. And from there, it became a major nuclear power. Now, North Korea and Chinese relationship, I think, I think it is very similar, not exactly the same, but similar, uh, in that uh, after the Soviet collapse in early 1990s, North Korea's nuclear umbrella was gone, according to North Koreans. So therefore, uh, they tried to rely on the Chinese, but Chinese are a little bit wishy-washy, and now, of course, they also established diplomatic relations with South Korea. So that's one of the major impetus from, impetus from, in my perspective, that North Koreans want to have its own uh, nuclear program to basically to defy any potential Chinese control. Uh, you know, so they, have, they want to have their, uh, their own uh, program. Now, for the Chinese, obviously, like the Soviet Union, Chinese did not like North Korea to have, have its own independent nuclear program for reason of a, a, a reliance partnership. Uh, so they opposed a little bit. Uh, but then later on, when, Kim, when the Qin dynasty devoted so much of its national resources to develop its own nuclear programs, and China saw another opportunity to create a different kind of, a, kind of a, a dependency uh, 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 for the North Koreans. That is, the North Koreans spent so much money on its weapons particularly nuclear weapons, the country went broke. It needs China's economic, particularly the stables of food, oil, uh, energy uh, supply. So North Korea, even though it's intention to declare nuclear weapons to get away from Chinese control, but in the end, they are more and more dependent on the Chinese for its regime survival. So if, if you agree with me on this, um, and then I will say, uh, Yes, there is opportunity for the U.S. to exploit that kind of a peculiar relationship, just like Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger exploit the Chinese-Soviet relationship in, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. But again, history is a very tricky thing. You know, uh, history does not repeat itself, uh, and the North Korean regime is not necessarily the exact same as the Mao regime. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't know how we could play out this, but I, I do see an opportunity. Uh, how to exploit that opportunity needs somebody who is very smart, who is very uh, 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 flexible, and has a long-term uh, 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 strategic outlook, because this is not just a North Korea-US problem. It also deals with the regional alliance. Um, that is uh, 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 South Korea and uh, and Japan there, uh, but I did see if you if you if you pay attention closely, that actually was exactly what President Trump offered Kim when the two sat down. That is, you gave up your nuclear program, you gave up your weapons of mass destruction, and the way the United States and international community can make your economy uh, 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 come back. And gave you economic assi uh, assistance. He didn't uh, uh, give a specific term uh, amount, but that was basically the rhetoric. That was the talking point. Thank you, Brendan Mulvani. Hey, Miles. Good to see you again. Hey, Brendan. Thanks for the talk. Hey, I, so I wanted to see what you thought policy options were for the U.S. to combat uh, China trying to split. Uh, Korea and Japan are two allies there in East Asia, uh, as they try to do and foment the the bad blood between them. Is there anything we can do from the U.S. side? Uh, 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 the answer is yes, and the uh, the uh, the uh, the prospect is a little bit more difficult. Let me just share a few uh, um, a few thoughts with you on that. Uh, one of the decisive advantage of the United States has over China in this global competition is that the United States has a global system of allies. Uh, and we have, China does not have any 
meaningful alliance at all. China has 14 land uh, uh, neighbors. At some point in the last half a century, in one way or another, China has dispute with every one of them. Let alone the half dozen maritime neighbors. Uh, so China is very difficult. It's China, difficult for China to develop any kind of alliance right now uh, because it does not have this kind of you know uh, 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 credibility to develop uh, such a thing. The United States has a global alliance. However, we also have uh, a, a big weakness in our alliance system. Uh, that is this. Let me explain. We have a rock solid alliance in NATO, in Europe. That's because it's a multilateral. It's a mutual defense alliance of many nations, close to 30 right now. So any one of them is under attack by a third party. Everybody is jumping into it through Article 5. Our alliance system in Asia is fundamentally different. We don't have a multilateral alliance. All our alliance in Asia Pacific is, is bilateral. We try in the 50s in CETO, it didn't work out very well. Uh, the reason is complicated. I actually wrote something uh, uh, for Hoover Institution a, a few years back on this. In other words, we have a bilateral relationship uh, alliance uh, with many countries. We have a bilateral mutual defense uh, agreement with South Korea, with Japan, and with the Philippines. The Chinese see this, so they exploit it as much as they could. The most meaningful alliance, be, a little bit beyond that, is the, is the tripartite alliance between US, South Korea, and Japan. And that's where China saw the weakness. So that's why they try to break this, this uh, trilateral relationship as much as they can. And the weak point they use is basically the uh, the uh, the sentimental disagreement, the policy dis disagreement between uh, South Korea and Japan. They ex explored that admirably uh, over the decades, uh, and then they almost succeeded. And I think they still uh, are are doing that. Um, and if we're not very careful, we might uh, lose the alliance. It's very hard to for the United States to put together the South Korea and Japanese allies to talk about the importance of the common threat that is China and even North Korea. When I was in the State Department, I tried to get all the policy planners to have a trilateral meeting. I worked that for about two months. Two months in my short life at the State Department, that's a lot of time. So finally, we finally get, get the, the top uh, uh, China people from Tokyo and from Seoul come to, uh, to the State Department. We have a, a very nice meeting, but they all talk about their own, each side talk about their own, own case. Um, they basically complain about each other in the meeting. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that is a very unfortunate. I hope that South Korea and Japan would really transcend some of the issues. This is this is not easy to do. It has its own uh, domestic electorate, and but we need leadership. Leadership, but we can see something that's much bigger uh, than the regional issues between the two countries. So uh, since this is the Korea uh, forum, so I don't want to delve too much into that. Uh, but I, I do think uh, it's a very, very daunting task at this moment. Thank you, Miles. Larry Nix. Uh, thank you, uh, Sangju. Can you hear me? Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yu. I want to focus uh, a little bit more specifically on the uh, Biden administration here. President Biden has emphasized alliance solidarity, as I think you've alluded to already. And of course, he criticized President Trump for in his view, weakening alliance solidarity. Now we have the Taiwan issue emerging. With, in recent days, 
several U.S. military commanders testifying to Congress that the Chinese military threat to Taiwan is growing. I believe the commander in chief of the U.S. Pacific Command warned that he believed that a Chinese attack on Taiwan could come within six years, possibly sooner. I have a three-part question about how the Biden administration would support or would need to react to this eventuality that our military leaders have been warning about in recent days. First, with regard to South Korea, should the Biden administration expect in the eventuality that the U.S. intervenes to help defend Taiwan, should the Biden administration expect in that situation direct military support from South Korea, as clearly President Biden indicated that he expects direct military support from Japan in the recent summit he had with Prime Minister Suga. Uh, Suga. Secondly, Taiwan was a high priority issue in the Biden-Suga summit. Should Taiwan be a high priority issue in the same way when in the near future, President Biden meets with President Moon? And thirdly, in that meeting, when it occurs, and it's going to occur soon, should President Biden propose a joint statement on Taiwan in a joint communique with President Moon of a nature similar to the joint statement that he issued with Prime Minister Suga about Taiwan, which has drawn a lot of attention from people. So in terms of South Korea, in those three areas, how do you think President Biden should conduct or lay out and implement U.S. policy? Thank you, Larry. Okay, uh, that's a very uh, uh, tripartite question. <laughs> Let me. Uh, the, uh, you, yeah, you actually gave the answer, uh, uh, Larry, and I think you know uh, the answer. Uh, my advice to uh, 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 President Biden would be: Yes, we should ask South Korea, Japan, you know, uh, to to contribute to to the defense of Taiwan, and I'll tell you why. Uh, uh, the Taiwan issue is not just a, a issue uh, uh, related to the independence of Taiwan. It's, it's not an issue of, of, of between China and, and, and Taiwan. You know, I'm a historian. Uh, if you look at the history uh, in the 30s and the 40s, uh, an aggressive country normally does not stop at one part of a territorial dispute. In March 1938, Hitler annexed Austria. And then next thing he wanted Sudetenland. After Sudetenland, he won the Polish corridor. And so if you're an aggressive country, you want to solve all those problems in a succession. I mentioned earlier, China is a country with more territorial disputes with his neighbors than with any other, than any other country in the world. So China now is capable of fulfill its historical mission of unification motherland. Well, the question is, where is the motherland? How big it is? Uh, if you would if you would, would listen to the Chinese Communist Party, you would believe it. That includes the South China Sea. Taiwan, obviously Hong Kong, and Senkakus, and then there's a disputed territory between South Korea and China, and uh, uh, and later on there's still the issue. My South Korean friends will, will, will definitely recognize the issue of Gando. You know that's a uh, in China is a Yanbian. 
So that's there are a lot of historical issues. After that, China will go, go back to the uh, territorial disputes with Russia. That's a major issue there. So it's still in the Chinese historical uh, consciousness. So I look at the Taiwan issue is not just a isolated issue between China, Taiwan, not even between China, Taiwan, and the United States. We have this Taiwan Relations Act. We have all these uh, uh, six assurances. We have some kind of uh, 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 obligations, short of a direct uh, military involvement. But I see this Taiwan issue as a collective defense problem for the entire region, just like you know Aust Austria, Sudetenland, Korish Portugal. It's one of the chains. Uh, uh, so, so that's why I think you know all this country in East Asia in the region should really come together to stop the Chinese ambition as early as possible. You never know. You know when China got if they invaded Taiwan and they might just go after Senkakus. After that, maybe it's 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 a territory in in, in between uh, India and China. That's a huge chunk of a disputed territory. So. So this is a, basically we have to understand the nature of the Chinese strategic thinking. Uh, it has some kind of a you know, mission driven, and it has it's it it, it it's a, a, a it's a promised uh, 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 obligation uh, to its own people to its own uh, itself. So uh, from that point of view, uh, I think you know uh, we should all realize this is a collective defense problem, not just a Taiwan problem. Thank you, Miles. Tom Countryman? If not, Paul Davis. I'm sorry, this is Tom, Tom Countryman. Can you hear me now? OK, Tom? Uh, the question I had uh, thought to ask is very similar to one that has already been discussed, which are the prospects for uh, Japan and the Republic of Korea to reconcile their differences sufficiently that the U.S., South Korea, and Japan can speak with one voice on the North Korean issue. Uh, I uh, welcome some of the things President Trump did, but I was concerned that we had three different voices speaking about the South, the North Korean problem in a way that didn't advance our common interests. So uh, I know you've partly answered it, but I welcome any further thoughts you have. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I think, you know, uh, again, let me just add uh, to what I, uh, I, I should have said. Uh, one of the key issues that can help us transcend the uh, differences between um, allies among allies is to have a complete understanding of the goal. Uh, the goal here is complete full denuclearization of North Korea. Yes, there is a national unification. Yes, there is many other issues. There is a World War II historical issues. Those are all there, but the common goal, the ultimate goal uh, is complete denuclearization of North Korea. And we should keep our eyes on the price. And that is the price. So if we do not agree on that, uh, and then we got a problem. So I will say in this regard, if I may, um, uh, uh, if I, uh, I apologize if I might hurt some people's feelings. I think that in this regard, the United States and Japan uh, are more in agreement on that goal. It is with the South Korean government that we often sometimes have a disagreement. And I think South Korean government under the current president uh, uh, try to do both, denuclearization as well as national unification. It's very important. You know, I'm not saying it's national unification is not, is not important. There is a sequence. There is a, uh, there is a, a, a top priority versus secondary. So. Uh, again, this issue ought to be discussed um, openly, and I think I think there is also the need to to listen. U.S. alliance with Japan and Korea uh, are so deep and uh, uh, so important 
uh, I, you know, uh, Joe Bosco and several other colleagues here are uh, uh, all DOD person, uh, personnel at some point. Um, you know, the military interoperability between uh, North South Korean armed military and the U.S. Army, uh, U.S. military is 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 incomparable, is unparalleled, is amazing. Uh, and our, of course, our military alliance with with uh, cooperating with Japan is also deep. We have tens of thousands of troops in either of these countries. So our commitment is solid. Yes, there is there is an argument uh, over uh, the cost, burden sharing, uh, to use the State Department uh, jargon. Uh, uh, but those are temporary issues. Um, and uh, so we can go over that. Uh, and I think the common goal should be very, very clear. Thank you. Golden Grout? Golden? Can you hear me? Okay, I hear you. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Well, my question was really in regards to the average citizen of the United States. Uh, what can we who don't know so much about uh, the depth of the history and the relationships with these countries, what can we do uh, both to educate ourselves and to promote um, unity among our, uh, our friends and unite um, in our hearts as a, as a whole nation against um, any evil, be it you know, communism or, or anything else in your estimation? Thank you. Well, that has something to do with, uh, you know, <laughs> short answer is uh, watch more Jeopardy. I found that their, their geo quiz is amazing. You know, it's very, very good uh, to, uh, 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 I have a 14 year old at home. So he and I watch Jeopardy every day. Uh, we learn quite a bit. Uh, kidding aside, I will say uh, America is a country of global significance. We often forget about that. And uh, despite all those up and downs of self-doubt of recent years, uh, we are the beacon of hope for a lot of people in the world. So uh, the self-imposed defeatism in, uh, in the face of Chinese rise uh, sometimes can be very, very uh, 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 discouraging. So I would say for average Americans, uh, we we should definitely realize how important it is uh, for the United States to play a global role in sustaining freedom, democracy, and some of the major key institutions. It's not just for the United States. If we are not standing up to the Chinese attempt to dominate uh, South China Sea, few other countries would. Uh, if we take the lead, and I think you know uh, other countries uh, of, uh, of a similar mind would uh, would follow. Uh, one very good example is uh, uh, the Trump administration's um, action in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, four or five years ago, it would have been unimaginable for us to send warships routinely passing through the Taiwan Strait without Chinese permission. They would have protested, and, and we would have balked. But during the Trump administration, uh, we say it's in national water. It's in international water. We have a right to, to pass through without anybody's permission. We did the scores of times. And the Chinese acquiesced to that. Uh, so and after we did that, and the uh, friends and allies sent their warships passing through. Germany, French, you know, uh, Japanese, South Koreans, Can Canadians, they all do this. And we essentially internationalized the very vital uh, water land. And that's the best defense for Taiwan. So that's just every one example. So I think, you know, we Americans, average Americans, we should realize uh, how important we are uh, in sustaining global uh, peace. And uh, it, it, it is not imperialism in the traditional 19th century sense. Uh, it is America is a global country. We have to preserve a global trading trade system, global currency system. And so, uh, and of course, we have we would like to have as many partners and allies as possible. So that probably is one thing that we have to do. And uh, uh, the political culture right now in the United States is very disheartening to me personally, as a new immigrant to this country, uh, to see uh, the constant 
self-doubt about the fundamental goodness of the American democracy. And that is very devastating to, to people like me. Uh, so, uh, so that's why I keep telling my, my midshipmen at the U.S. Naval Academy uh, how important it is to have a firm understanding of our own system and to have utter unapologetic self-confidence in our own uh, system and, and the merits of our institutions. Thank you, Miles. In Hano? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, you know, go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, as you uh, indicated, Chinese are after a global hegemony. I'd like to know why they have to go for hegemony over uh, the U.S. or for any reason. But uh, I'm interested in particularly uh, internal reasons why they have to go for a national agenda such as uh, uh, global hegemony to unite the 1.4 billion people. What do you think? Okay, so again, that's a very nuanced, uh, great question that uh, you know uh, 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 I personally have written quite a bit on that. Uh, let me just try to be uh, concise and brief as possible. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we uh, should understand is the uh, the Chinese Communist Party the strategic paranoia. This is related to their ideological commitment to Marxism-Leninism. According to Marxist-Leninism, the party firmly believes it. Xi Jinping talks about it all the time. That is, the socialist cause is so noble, so great. International anti-China forces, anti-socialist capitalist forces will never relent trying to stifle it, to kill it. So China had this kind of a very strong sense of paranoia. Everywhere there is a, uh, every, they, they do, they see is from this perspective. Uh, it, it is always a US led anti-China forces to do China in. Uh, and that's why Xi Jinping sees this as a epic struggle between international capitalist system and Chinese, the socialism led by China. By the way, all socialist party, communist party has failed because of their own inadequacies, their revisionism. China is the only socialist country that's carrying on the torch of socialism, Marxism, and to its ultimate triumph. This is a Xi Jinping in his talks. Everywhere he, he talks about this uh, on a routine basis. So because of this, uh, China sees this epic struggle and he sees all these China's problems with the international community as an attempt to get rid of Chinese communist rule. So because this challenge to China and Chinese socialist cause is global, China must respond globally. And that's why China always positions itself as a global uh, 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 force to combat all this American hegemony and international capitalist hegemony. Uh, Belt and Road is one of the things, right? Uh, and uh, so, so that's basically is one of the most important impetuses for Chinese global dominance. Because as China said, if they don't do it, they'll be dead. And that's why in the Chinese parlance, you hear Xi Jinping, Deng Xiaoping, Mao Zedong talk about all the time. That is, this epic struggle is a matter of you die, I live, zero sum game. So this is very, very clear to them. That's the impetus, they have to do it. Secondly, uh, related to the Chinese uh, 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 self-centrism, Sino-centrism, China has developed this very deep victimhood mentality. It says that since the time of the Opium War, the great nation like China has been bullied. And by the way, China is the moral and institutional center of the world. It has all the wonderful things. So China's victimhood is exaggerated and intensified by their own assertion that it is not just how much we have been humiliated, how many reparations were imposed upon to pay those in invaders. It is the fact that such a great civilization like China has been bullied and humiliated by all the other inferior countries. 
So when China goes to South China Sea, when China goes have a problem with several other countries, India, for example, it's not just a matter of avenge historical wrongs. It's a matter of teaching this little country, Xiaoguo, a lesson. Make them realize China is a moral and institutional center of the universe. And therefore, that's basically the essence of Chinese nationalism. And that create a very strong and powerful impetus for China to go global, to establish what China uh, is called itself. Uh, they have different viewfinisms, you know, uh, you know, common destiny, community, whatever that the Xi Jinping has been saying. Uh, it's never clearly spelled out, but it is definitely in the Chinese group collective consciousness. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thanks, Okay, then Don Kirk, wake up, Don. <laughs> Don, wake up and unmute your button. <laughs> he doesn't know how to, what to do with this button. Unmute your button and speak, Don, from Seoul. Okay, you got it. I'm here. Actually, I'm here in Washington. Oh, uh, you're in Washington. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was very interested in uh, in uh, uh, Professor or Dr. Yu's remarks about uh, about China's aggressive intentions here and there. I don't know, believe it or not, I don't think you emphasize their aggressive intentions vis-a-vis -vis Korea as much as you might have. And in that context, I'm wondering where uh, what you think of uh, of Donald Trump's uh, friendship with Kim Jong Un what this might have done to encourage China and what Trump's uh, criticism, scathing criticism of our ally, uh, President Moon Jae-in, we may not agree with everything, but he is the president of, the, of our ally. What you think of uh, Trump's praising the leader of North Korea while criticizing uh, brutally the leader of South Korea, what this is doing in terms of China's aggressive intentions and in terms of the tension on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Thank you, Don. <laughs> I think we have to really uh, make a uh, clear distinction between uh, political rhetoric <laughs> and, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and a strategy. Um, when I hear President Trump say he's in love with Kim Jong-un, uh, he and Xi Jinping are good friends. Uh, you know, President Trump is a survivor of Manhattan real estate and uh, 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 beauty pageant, casino business. He deal with shady characters more than probably any president in the history of this country. So he didn't have to uh, like him, like them, but sometimes in order to achieve the goal, he had to work with them. So, uh, I don't think anybody should for a moment believe that he was in love with Kim Jong-un, okay? Uh, I don't believe for a moment he really, really was in love with Xi Jinping. Uh, but as a leader of this nation of great consequence, he cannot just go there to antagonize everybody and we go to war. So I, I consider that is a, um, a pretty good quality as the, uh, as the leader of the nation. And I'll tell you what, uh, one very important aspect of, uh, of uh, President Trump's leadership uh, has something to do, which, which is very rare uh, in a sense, uh, uh, that President Trump really allows his uh, subordinates to carry out their bureaucratic duties to their full, to his fullest. When he emphasized on the steady relationship with, with Xi Jinping, he never stopped Secretary Pompeo to carry out his foreign policy with China in the Pompeo-esque approach. So uh, occasionally he will make a phone call to inquire and, uh, and then Secretary Pompeo would give him the answer. He seemed to be happy. And he would say, Mike, keep going, Do great job. So, so that's basically, it is, is, I think that's leadership that, that we, uh, we rarely appreciate in that sense. Uh, 
And uh, uh, I participated in so many White House PCCs, the Policy Coordinating Committee, and you know, many of you in the government uh, you know before. It's a madhouse normally, you know. And then everybody argue. In the end, the policy that came out uh, to the public is probably the, the optimum uh, solution. So it's quite democratic in that way. Um, so the most important thing is uh, there should be some kind of a debate, some kind of deliberation using our bureaucratic talents. Uh, uh, that's kind of uh, sounds meta, sounds a little bit oxymoron, uh, uh, but but it is true. Uh, it is so. I think I think you know when President Trump criticizes our allies, uh, it reminds me of my wife's constant critical criticism of myself. So that doesn't this mean he, she doesn't love me. So there is there is a there is that aspect of that. Um, allies can talk candidly. Allies can can share ideas without any uh, 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 sort of pretense. I mean, I think in many of the leaders do not have the quality. That's one reason we got the, we got into trouble. And uh, 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 when we deal with the Brits, the British and, and, and Americans have special relationship, but they have some policies that we disagree strongly. Uh, and uh, and uh, under normal circumstances, uh, the Brits would charm us with their good tea and their their peculiar quaint, quaint accent. Uh, uh, we don't do that. We didn't do that. And we we were very candid. We point out essentially, eventually, the two countries come together much much closer. And because common values do matter in that sense, not personal style entirely. And the but tragedy, uh, the tragedy of the Trump administration is that. Uh, so many of us were hung up on President Trump's personal style and forget the substance. And it's, uh, uh, one uh, colleague mentioned earlier that uh, uh, that we alienated our allies. Uh, as a matter of fact, we actually did our utmost to uh, to, uh, to to develop a multilateral approach on China. Many of our allies, including our many European allies, disagree with us. They want to try the middle way. In the end, uh, you know, we look like we're isolated, but in the end, we come together because of, of their own um, uh, volition. So this is a this is a one reason. So somebody mentioned that the, you know the fundamental difference between the Biden administration and Trump administration that the Biden, Trump administration is the unilateral, Biden administration is multilateral. That is not entirely true. We are we are just as multilateral as Biden administration. It's just toward the end of the uh, end of the. Uh, uh, this multilateral, uh, uh, you know, approach that uh, rapprochement that Biden administration is benefiting from actually was developed before the inauguration. Uh, we part well also thanks not only to our own effort but also to our friends' own uh, realization as well as China's behavior during the COVID. So I think the, the combination combined factors uh, gave the Biden administration a, a something to to to, to inherit the, for, uh, from. So. I think that's a, that's a good thing. I, I I totally agree with the Biden administration's approach uh, to to deal with the China problem from a multilateral point of view, and and but I don't think that's new. Thank you, Miles. It's Kim Jebom out there. Kim Jebom from Seoul. Yes, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak out, but uh, uh, I don't think I have uh, additional questions than. Uh, uh, the questions that I have presented previously uh, and uh, all the answers have been done. So thank you very much. OK, very good. Claudia Rosset out there? Yes, thank you. Go oh, hey, ahead, Claudia. Hi. I think I might be a bit in the dark. Thank you for a really interesting talk. Uh, my question is about how you read uh, to what China's government makes of our reaction and the world's reaction to the coronavirus, which we're not even allowed to call publicly the China virus, which has been the cover for what's happened in Hong Kong this past year, which has, I think, delivered all sorts of amazing relative benefits. Um, but may I ask you, is that how it looks to them and how much emboldened is the Communist Party of China by this experience, if it is. OK, uh, Claudia, thank you for the excellent question. And uh, uh, nice to finally see you in <laughs> face to face. Right. Thank you. This was yeah. wonderful. 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, the first public speech Xi Jinping gave to the public in direct response to the COVID was in mid-February 2020. This speech was very long, substantive, and he had two concerns. Number one, he wanted to enact an immediate national biosafety and biosecurity law. He said biosafety and biosecurity is a part of the national security, which means that he must have realized there's something, some kind of a violation of biosafety. Uh, you know, Secretary Pompeo and I wrote an uh, op-ed uh, in Claudia's uh, wonderful newspaper, Wall Street Journal, uh, a, a few weeks ago, in which we talk about this, uh, this abysmal record of China's biosafety. They, have, they were handling so many dangerous viruses and pathogens, but their safety measures were just terrible. And their own scientists were terribly, uh, were terribly worried about this too. So this COVID issue was actually uh, uh, not surprising to, to many people who actually know of uh, the extent to which China has been working on these viruses. That's number one issue Xi Jinping talked about in that February 2020 speech. The second most part of the speech, which is the most important to which he devoted the most of, this, uh, of, of his talk, was about how to control the propaganda of this effort to combat the virus how to make this effort to combat com of combating this virus as a glorious opportunity to demonstrate the all, overall greatness of the Chinese Communist Party. He emphasized on the vanguard role of the Chinese Communist Party members. He recognized, he urged people use the systemic advantage of the uh, Chinese socialist system, which means that government can really monopolize human and, and material resources to do big things. He also mentioned how important it is to control the narrative. This is not internal secret documents. This is a public speech. He wanted to make sure the whole nation understands that we have to really give the world what we call positive energy. Everything about this, this, uh, this effort has to be positive. There's nothing negative that should be allowed in radio, print, and uh, 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 internet media. So this is the guideline he gave. And clearly, combating the disease is important. But what occupied his mind, far more importantly, is to preserve the image of the party and to basically enhance, strengthen the Chinese Communist Party. This is basically what he's trying to do. And to do that, of course, you would have to lie. You would have to cover up all this, the truth. You would have to really doctor the numbers of the death. And uh, you would also have to really manipulate the international, uh, 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 just nomenclature, for example, how to name, how to call this thing. By the way, uh, the internationally woke WHO in order to uh, take care of the Chinese sensibility. Uh, and they volunteered to say, hey, listen, we're not gonna call the China virus, Wuhan virus, we're gonna call it COVID-19. Uh, by the way, so they, they, they thought the Chinese will be happy. As a matter of fact, the Chinese Communist Party never liked COVID-19. You couldn't even find a, a Chinese translation of COVID-19 in Chinese. They don't use that. Uh, the reason is very simple. They like the COVID part, but they didn't like the 19 part. 19 means 2019. And in 2019, there was only one place on the face of the earth that had outbreak, and that is China. That's why the Chinese Communist Party never used that COVID-19. So this is why they try to control the narrative. They try very hard to convince the world there are multiple outbreak points of the COVID in the US, in Italy, you know, in some other places, which is total nonsense. But this is why they try to do it. So, so to answer your question, Claudia, I, I, I think you know, definitely they try to use this opportunity. This is not the only one. Chinese Communist Party has turned every natural or man-made disaster 
to strengthen the image and the role of Chinese Communist Party. When you have a flood, it's a great opportunity for them to show how heroic the party's uh, uh, members have become. So this is a, this is a, a, a different kind of a political uh, culture and a strategic uh, environment that we're talking about. Thank you, Miles. Jasper Brown? Yes. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, Dr. Yu, you know, uh, I agree with almost everything you've been saying. Really, I do. Uh, except for at the very beginning. The very beginning, you talked about Marx and Leninism and the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I taught a course last, uh, last month on Chinese finance, Chinese domestic finance, not international, but their domestic finance. And uh, it was so fascinating uh, to what I, how much I learned. I've studied China for 30, 40 years, but I learned more preparing for that class. What I learned was the extent of capitalism in China is just tremendous. 900 million Chinese in the last four years have got their smartphone anti-pay, ant-pay, alipay, wechat pay. They circumvent the banking system. They go directly. It's more capitalistic than we are. And that's why they're so becoming so rich, so progressive. It's, be, it's the capitalist that's driving China right now. Now, I agree that's causing a lot of problems for everybody. It's creating a lot of products in China, a lot of progress in China. But I'm thinking if you're the Marxist in the Chinese Communist Party, you're feeling, wow, you're feeling tremendous pressure from that. You've lost control of your money system, basically. And, uh, you know, that's all what Marxism is. It's all about controlling money. 30 years ago, they didn't have any money. Now it's all smartphone money. And that smartphone money, you know, it can leave the country in a, in a millisecond. It can come to South. I think it's something the regional countries need to be watching very closely. Chinese money will be coming into Korea, changing a lot of things. So I quite agree with you about the nationalism part and the power part. But I think the ideology part is so vacuous in China, that might even be a danger because the, the party is so, um, it's, it's so ridiculous. You know, here Marx, this party <laughs> with smartphone money, it makes no sense ideologically at all. So that was, that was my more of my comment. Okay, so I appreciate the comment. And I think you said you mentioned uh, that uh, you disagree with me uh, at, the, at the beginning part, but I don't think uh, you, you, you listen to my very beginning part. Uh, the very beginning part is that I think there is a tremendous difference between the Chinese people and the Chinese yeah, inner yeah, core. Right, right, right. Yeah, so the right. inner core, they, you, I agree with 100%. Majority of the Chinese people don't even believe it one out of Marxist ideology, that edge is gone. But the inner core of the Chinese Communist Party, the people who monopolize all powers in China, they are diehard Marxist-Leninist. They are believe in this epic struggle between the two social political systems. They are believe in this insidious international conspiracy of peaceful uh, evolution. They are believe in the idea of uh, uh, a perpetual revolution their belief in the idea of, uh, of the inexorable decline of international capitalism and the ultimate triumph of socialism. So it's all there that matters in the very inner core. Now you mentioned about money. It's very true. China has, has currency issue. The challenge to Chinese control, current party's control of, of, of currency is real. And that's why the get rid of the Alipay, the get rid of the Alibaba, because what, what Alibaba is trying to do is to create an alternative currency challenging to a central bank's power. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're getting in trouble. So they're reasserting its power over financial institutions. Jack Ma's problem, his mistake was that he ventured too deeply into what mattered to the Chinese Communist Party in finance, that is money. And also, if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's control of currency, it's amazingly effective and restrictive. They are current. They control a uh, lot of people are, are rich in China, but they are not allowed to move a lot of money outside of China. The maximum, the cap for individual per year is fifty thousand. 
that really is a very restrictive. That's why there's a rampant international money laundering. People try to every way to get our money out of China. So if you are an American company, you invest a billion dollar in China, you cannot, you are not able to to get that money out of China profits, which means yeah, but- China really should pile on all money into more and more money into China. So China's currency control is a very very uh, restrictive. So I don't think they're losing the control. Now I will tell you what. One really big threat to Chinese control of currency is not really us or Alipay or anything. It's really Bitcoin. It's really yeah, digital. Right, right. So this is not just a challenge to China, but all central bank have the problem yeah, because right, Bitcoin right. Is, is the major feature of Bitcoin is really decentralization of currency. So the Chinese government right now, they're the first major country to counter. So they're trying to, they're experimenting the digitalization uh, of currency, the CBDC thing. Yeah, so sure. that's why they were they were afraid of this, but they also exert the most vigorous control of the con- of currency. So you're absolutely right. Uh, if you lose current control over currency, you lose a lot of things. And I don't think Chinese Communist Party is going to allow that to happen. Thank you, Miles. Ladies and gentlemen, the time is up. Thank you very much for everybody. And uh, this is a great conference. Thank you, Miles. I really appreciate your contribution to this t- debate. We will get back to you. The meeting okay. Is Thank you very much, everyone. Good night and good morning. Good morning.